The gubernatorial recall election in California has highlighted the role of mail-in voting in elections. Arguments over mail-in voting are often left versus right. But neither side is giving you the whole picture. Welcome to America Uncovered. I'm Chris Chappell. Please be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell to be the first to view all of our new content. And speaking of new, it looks like Gavin Newsom is the new governor of California. Again. Last week, California held a special election to decide if Gavin Newsom would be recalled as governor. And he faced some stiff competition. Although not all of the votes have been tallied, Newsom has been declared the winner allowing him to continue his first term as governor of California and run for a second term in 2022 if he chooses. And in classic American style, some of the media are already looking towards Newsom's 2022 campaign. But why should I care? I live in New York. And now that I'm YouTube famous, I've abandoned all my family and friends in California. Enjoy the overpriced apartments, garbage in the streets, and wildly unpopular governor suckers. New York doesn't have to deal with any of that. But still, there are two main reasons why the California recall election might be interesting to the rest of us. The first is that some Democrats apparently see it as a sign of what's to come in the 2022 midterm elections. Although Republicans have pointed out that what happens in California is rarely an indication of what the rest of the country is going to do. What? You mean to tell me people in North Dakota don't use healing crystals on their emotional support ferrets? The other reason that I should apparently care about the California recall election is because of what it says about the future of mail-in voting. What does the California recall election have to do with the future of mail-in voting? Well, let's take a look and see, starting with a little background on the recall election. It may seem strange now, looking back, but the California recall election was not a foregone conclusion. Some say that Gavin Newsom won the recall election easily, or that he cruised to victory, or that he ran away with it, naked, while holding a chainsaw. And indeed, as of when we recorded this episode, almost 63% of all votes counted in the California recall election have opted to keep Newsom in office as governor, which is a landslide by any measure. But before the results were in, a lot of people were worried, and they had reason to be, since polls of likely voters seemed to show an uncertain outcome, according to the New York Times. I was uncertain too. I thought Angeline the Billboard Queen had a real shot, considering she had name recognition from the 12,000 jokes we made about her. The thing is, by the numbers, California is a deep blue state, with registered Democrats making up nearly 47% of the electorate and registered Republicans making up just 24%, according to the California State Report of Registration. Those who were worried about the outcome of the recall election might have been looking with suspicion at the 23% of the electorate that lists no party preference. Then again, it is California, which means they likely prefer the party that has the most coke. But the real issue was getting Democrats to actually vote. As the New York Times put it on August 17th, the vote is expected to come down to whether Democrats can mobilize enough of the state's enormous base to counteract Republican enthusiasm for Gavin Newsom's ouster. And so, for the nail-biting Democrats, the outcome hung at least partially on one thing. Mail-in voting. That, and California's not realizing, the best option was clearly Angeline. 12,001. And Democrats weren't the only ones who thought mail-in ballots mattered. The reason mail-in voting has become such an issue in the California recall election is that California used an all-male voting system in the recall election, just as it did in the November 2020 election. You see, there are lots of ways to run elections, and every state does it slightly differently. Before COVID, most states had primarily in-person voting, where eligible voters went to polling sites to cast their votes, except for Florida where votes are cast by throwing Molotov cocktails in a Buffalo Wild Wings. The pandemic has changed some things. But even before COVID, seven states used an all-male voting or vote-at-home system. In an all-male voting system, all eligible voters have a ballot mailed to the address listed on their voter registration. 
they then have a choice. They can return their completed ballot by mail, drop the completed ballot off at a designated drop box, take their completed ballot to a polling place on election day, or vote in person at a polling place on election day. Or they can just not vote. That's always an option, sometimes an attractive option. Anyway, if you live in Colorado, Hawaii, Nevada, Oregon, Utah, Vermont, or Washington, as long as you are registered to vote and have an updated address, your opportunity to vote simply shows up in your mailbox, often accompanied by a booklet that explains what's on the ballot. And for the 2020 election, a lot more people did mail-in voting because they were concerned about getting COVID if they went to vote in person. California, New Jersey, and Washington, D.C. joined the all-mail voting bandwagon, while many other states changed the rules to make it easier for voters to get absentee ballots, which have to be requested in advance. Even in Florida, where you can now mail your Molotov cocktail to a Buffalo Wild Wings. Since 2020, California has been an all-mail voting state. And during the California recall election, more than a third of California's active registered voters had cast their ballots by Saturday, several days before polls close, according to the New York Times. Which may signal a shift in the voting timeline for Californians, especially if Governor Newsom signs a recently passed bill that would make California a permanent all-male voting state. So what does that have to do with mail-in voting as a whole? Well. If mail-in voting spreads to other states, the data from California's recall election might even signal a shift in the voting timeline for all Americans. So, using healing crystals on emotional support ferrets might not be the only thing North Dakotans take from California. H.R. 1, the voting rights bill the House of Representatives tried to pass earlier this year, suggested just such a switch over to all-male voting throughout the United States. So changing trends in California could very well be a sign of what's to come in the United States if the Democratic Party has their way. Gone may be the polling day crowds, the long lines, the sweet smell of bureaucracy in action, all replaced by unusually busy postal workers. You know where that goes. Of course, H.R. 1 was defeated, but the move towards all-male voting has all but won in California, and it might not be over elsewhere. So. Should we be worried about that? Is the California recall election, in fact, a sign of things to come? We'll talk more about that after the break. Welcome back. California's recent recall election was the second all-male election in California, although other states, such as Oregon, have been all-male voting states for many years. Makes sense people in Portland wouldn't want to leave their homes. Now. Changing voting trends in California have some people looking to the future of mail-in voting, and that future is politically fraught. The pandemic voting changes led a lot of people to question whether mail-in voting leads to an increase in election fraud. This has led to the biggest mail review since Thunder from Down Under. Not that type of mail. That's better. There was a partisan war over the security of mail-in voting. Sources on the left, such as the Brookings Institution, argue that voter fraud is very rare, and mail-in voter fraud is even rarer. Sources on the right are a little more alarmist. And sources from the Green Party argue that mail-in voting creates a lot of extra trash. And annoying arguments like that are why nobody votes for the Green Party. The numbers appear to support the left on this one. The Washington Post analyzed data from three all-male voting states and found that officials identified just 372 possible cases of double voting or voting on behalf of deceased people out of about 14.6 million votes cast by mail in the 2016 and 2018 general elections. Meanwhile, the Heritage Foundation, which maintains an online database of alleged election fraud cases from the last 20 years, contains 1,333 incidents. Of those, just 204 involved mail-in ballots, according to the Brennan Center for Justice. And cases of alleged voter fraud that go to court are rare. Convictions are even rarer. And executions are rarer still. But that'll teach them to mess with the sanctity of the American Idol voting process. Although the Heritage Foundation says there's more to it than just those numbers. One key problem is that voter fraud, unlike most other crime, won't get reported if no one gets caught. 
That being said, states that have been doing all-male voting for years, like Oregon, haven't seen much in the way of fraud, at least according to the Brookings Institution. And a report by the University of New Mexico, the UCLA Voting Rights Project, and the Union of Concerned Scientists. There's also a variety of security features on mail-in ballots, including the hand-marked paper ballot, sealed envelopes, secure drop boxes, identity verification systems, tabulator anti-counterfeit systems, and ballot tracking, as well as a mini Wolverine guarding the envelope. I add that to mine, because I take election security very seriously. All these security features are why some say mail-in voting fraud is nearly impossible to commit. But not every state follows all of the voting security best practices recommended by the U.S. Election Assistance Commission and the National Conference of State Legislatures. And you can see how far states are from best practices in this analysis of overall voting security. Not a single state got a grade of A overall. But fittingly, there was an F for Florida. I'm shocked this is coming from the state that botched the 2000 presidential election. There are, of course, stories of people willing to make the effort to bypass security features. Even my mini Wolverine. But confirmed cases of voter fraud are rare. At the same time, voting security isn't always as good as it could be, and there are reports of fraud occurring. Should states be cautious about mail-in voting? Maybe they should, but not necessarily because of fraud. I'll tell you why after the break. Welcome back. California's recall election has mail-in voting back in the news, along with concerns about mail-in voting security. But since 2020, the conversation about mail-in voting has centered around security, fraud, and whether mail-in voting favors one party over another. Although I've been talking about mail-in voter fraud since 2017, when Crispy Taco won the Lay's Potato Chip Do Us a Flavor contest, when everything bagel was clearly the superior option. Someone obviously cheated. But in 2020, mail-in voting, including both all-mail voting and absentee voting, skyrocketed. That's according to a survey conducted by the U.S. Election Assistance Commission, a government agency. According to the survey, mail-in voting was the most common way people voted in the 2020 election, a big change from previous years. And mail-in voting turnout especially increased for states that did all-mail voting. In some cases, there were problems. I'm not talking about fraud, no, no. I'm talking about good old-fashioned, nonpartisan government incompetence. Like New York City's botched primary in June of last year, when one in five mail-in ballots were rejected. The system was overloaded when the state opened up voting by mail to everyone to prevent the spread of COVID-19, and saw a tenfold increase in ballot requests. As a result, two congressional races weren't decided for weeks, and election officials were blamed for mishandling tens of thousands of mail-in ballots. And even without the pressure of COVID lockdowns, there have been mistakes made with mail-in ballots. Like when hundreds of completed ballots for New York's November 2017 election weren't delivered to the Board of Elections until April 2018. They were apparently stranded at a Brooklyn post office for five months. In this case, the New York Board of Elections blamed the Postal Service, which was probably a bad idea. Worries over lost and mishandled ballots is one reason a conservative nonprofit called the Public Interest Legal Foundation made headlines when they released a report claiming that nearly 15 million ballots went unaccounted for in the 2020 election. What does unaccounted for mean? Poof? Disappeared? Not exactly. The group got their data from the U.S. Election Assistance Commission survey I mentioned earlier. It said that out of more than 90 million mail-in ballots, about 15 million had an unknown status. Unknown status was defined in the survey as all transmitted by mail ballots that were not returned by voter, spoiled, returned as undeliverable, or otherwise unable to be tracked. Unable to be tracked? Did they even try calling Dog the ballot hunter? But what the conservative group didn't say is that those unknown status ballots also included voters who were sent a mail-in ballot but chose not to vote, which again is sometimes an attractive option. 
Now that's less likely for states where you have to request a mail-in ballot, because if you went to the trouble of doing that, you would presumably use it. But remember, in 2020, nine states plus DC sent mail ballots to all registered voters, which means voters can definitely get a ballot and then decide not to use it, or just throw it in the trash because they thought it was one of those official-looking junk mail scams. The problem is, we don't know how many of those unaccounted for ballots are just people who decided not to vote. Last year, the Public Interest Legal Foundation made a similar claim that 28 million mail-in ballots went missing in the last decade, including the 2012 to 2018 elections. Again, using data from the U.S. Election Assistance Commission. The head of the liberal nonprofit National Vote at Home Institute, which pushes for nationwide all-male voting, wrote a rebuttal. Using average voter turnout rates for the states with all-male voting, she calculated that approximately 12 million of those ballots were people who just didn't vote, which seems like a reasonable assumption. But then, she goes on to assume that the rest of the 16 million unaccounted for ballots are all people who requested ballots but didn't vote, and uses that to argue that mail-in voting dramatically increases voter turnout. But again, we don't know if all those unaccounted for ballots are people who didn't vote. We just don't have that data. This is a good example of how interest groups on both the right and left can use the same government data for their own agendas. The conservative group hypes up the 28 million unaccounted for ballots as potential for voter fraud, while the liberal group uses it to argue that mail-in ballots are better because voter turnout is much higher. And it's also an example of a fundamental difference between both sides. Liberals are worried about voting accessibility, while conservatives are worried about voting security. Which is also why conservatives want states to clean up their voter registration rolls of ineligible and dead voters, while liberals accuse states of purging their voter registration rolls, including eligible voters. They're talking about the same thing, but in very different ways. So what do you think? Can all male voting work? Let us know in the comments. And remember, America Uncovered is mainly supported by viewers like you. So head on over to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash America Uncovered. And a special shout out to fans who contribute $5 or more per episode, like Hunter Frost, who joined us as a Patreon supporter this summer. Thank you, Hunter, and thank you to everyone else who helps us keep making all of these episodes every week. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. Thanks for watching America Uncovered.